Happy Monday, stackers. And if you had a fantastic weekend, you know why that was, OG? Uh, because you... No, I don't know. It was because somebody was out watching that Ukraine <sighs> mess, so you didn't have to. That's why. They're, just, they're withdrawing their troops. It's fine. It's going to be great. They're, they, be they were just getting together for the hokey pokey. That was it. But then they turned themselves around. Hey, uh, <laughs> is it too early? Uh, on behalf of the men and women here in the basement and the men and women of Navy Federal Credit Union want to give a big shout out to our troops to begin the week. Let's all go stack some Benjamins together, shall we? Hoorah. So you'll pick me up tonight at 745? Oh, well, no, I got a few things to, to take care of first, but what, why don't we make it quarter to eight? <laughs> Stop it. Okay, 745. <laughs> Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and how do you bring creativity to your job, even if you think it's not possible? Today, we welcome a man who was the longtime CEO of a marginally creative outfit called Cirque du Soleil, Daniel Lamar. You know, we're kind of the Cirque du Soleil of podcasts. We wear skin-tight suits, Joe's mom packs on so much makeup she looks like a clown, and we, too, go through 3,000 pounds of food a week. Speaking of clowns, I heard Daniel had one follow him around during the first few months on the job. What's that all about? He'll share the story today. Plus, we also have a Kim Kardashian-infested headline, a TikTok minute that can't be beat, We'll throw out the Haven lifeline to someone who threw us a softball, and then I'll swing into my Cirque du Soleil trivia. And now, two guys who would never clown you about money, it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. Better make sure, Doug, that Mom doesn't hear the line about the makeup. Yeah, I was kind of planning on her being out of the house. Mom goes grocery shopping. We immediately dive into the 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 mom throwing here. shade. Yes, right. hey everybody, happy salty Monday here on the podcast. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter, and looks like we got the coffee cups all out. Uh, Mr. OG, how are you today? It's happening. We're ready to talk Kim Kardashian Ooh. because we talk Kim Kardashian everywhere else. So Kim Kardashian today, we've got an amazing TikTok minute, but. The High Wire Act to kick off the week. How about this? The man from Cirque du Soleil, Daniel Lamar. It's a nice intro. This book. The High Wire Act. We we talk about a lot of topics here on the show, a lot of financially adjacent topics. Creativity, he will say, is not financially adjacent. That if you really want to be good at your job, no matter how straightforward you think it is, bring some creativity to it. And obviously, they have a little bit of that up there in Montreal. So that is all coming up. But first, all right, Kim Kardashian, Daniel Lamar, it's a hoot nanny. Let's get this party started. Let's do it. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. I had article 652 picked out for our headline where Robin Hood was back in trouble again. Uh, they can't stay out of the news. But then Bill, our, our stacker friend Bill, sent me an email with this one that I missed. And uh, I think this beats a Robin Hood headline any day of the week. Uh, this comes from The Hollywood Reporter. Can't figure out why I missed this one. Kim Kardashian and Floyd Merriweather sued by cryptocurrency investors. Paul Pierce is also among the defendants accused of duping followers in an alleged pump and dump scheme. People are angry, OG, because... Kim Kardashian, Floyd Merriweather, and others. Uh, Well, let's dive in. The lawsuit, which accuses the stars of misleading their followers in a pump and dump scheme, claims the celebrities convinced their fans to buy Ethereum Max tokens only to sell them once their value was inflated. They were allegedly paid in tokens for their sponsorships and exited with substantial gains, leaving investors holding the bag, the lawsuit claims. Defendants touted the prospect of the company and the ability for investors to make significant returns due to the favorable, quote, tokenomics. Nice. I thought tokenomics is what happened in basements in college towns. <laughs> exactly. 
Dear. Uh, of the of the Emax tokens rid the lawsuit filed last Friday in uh, California federal court. In truth, defendants marked the Emax tokens to investors so that they could sell their portions of the float for a profit. Here's the thing. Obviously. Cha, why else? Here's the thing. This was Bill's point of view, and I think I share it. Don't crypto investors like the fact that this is a decentralized currency and government is not going to be involved? And now we want to file a lawsuit that Ooh. in this space, like we want it both ways. No, no, no. Government, get out of here. Except when I feel like I got duped by a celebrity. And now I need government on my side. Well, that's an interesting take on the, you know, it looks it's decentralized. Oh, you got screwed. Tough patooties. Yeah, this decentralization, I, I don't like that anymore. I want, I want centralization. Centralize it. That's a bad idea. On June 14th, Kardashian posted for her 250 million followers. You know, she's got 250 million. We've got like 3,600. We're kind of in the same league. On Instagram, <laughs> an ad for Ethereum Max, which has no connection to established cryptocurrency Ethereum. See, this is, this is another thing. This is when you kind of know you're getting duped too, or you don't know that you're getting duped. They name it Ethereum Max. Like it's Ethereum, yeah. but it's better. But to the max. Yes. More Ethereum. She wrote, are you guys into crypto? This is not financial advice, but by the way, when somebody writes, this is not financial advice, but right. sharing what my friends just told me about the Ethereum max token. A few minutes ago, Ethereum max burned 400 trillion tokens, literally 50% of their admin wallet, giving back to the entire Emacs community. Swipe up to join the Emacs community, the Kardashian Post states. I wonder how much she got for that. What did she get for that post? Does it say? Did she say that it was a sponsored post on Instagram? Because don't you have to disclose that now? It doesn't say how much she makes, but it does say that this is not the first time she's been in legal trouble over making allegedly misleading claims and promotional endorsements. U.S. Food and Drug Administration ordered Kardashian back in 2015 to remove an ad promoting a morning sickness drug. There's some investors. So who are, you're saying that if Kim Kardashian tells me to buy crypto, I should probably do my own research. What are you, what are you talking on, about? Why on. would, why would we insinuate that? It's Kim Kardashian. Come on. Don't take advice from these idiots. <laughs> <laughs> take it from Kim Kardashian. Yeah. I know. Has anybody ever listened to the disclaimer at the end of our show? We should put that at the end of the show. Take it from Kim Kardashian, not us. <laughs> right. What are you talking about? You know, there is something too, though, OG, uh, very seriously, there is something too following insiders and in what they do if you're an individual stock trader. And uh, I found this piece interesting from all Congress people from invest people. Well, there is th there is now a fintech app that follows Congress yeah. people and is done yeah. is done pretty surprisingly. Uh, he said sarcastically is doing pretty pretty well. A diversified collection of stocks that purchases whatever Congress people buy. But you can follow what insiders trade, or at least before you make your sell move. You can see if insiders are buying or insiders are selling because most, most people when they hear insider trading, OG, they think illegal, but insider trading, if it's done within the law is legal and they have to tell you when they do it. Right. Yeah. When you think of insider trading, you think of doing something with information that's not public yet. What the SEC defines an insider as is somebody that has access to a whole bunch of information that is not public. And so those people have to follow specific rules as it relates to their trading. Most of them, frankly, set it up as a systematic purchase or systematic sell so they don't have to go through that process all the time. Otherwise, they have to get cleared by their company's general counsel, which will say, hey, this is a time when you would know what the information might be. So, you know, earnings are coming out in a week. You probably shouldn't sell a whole bunch of your stock right now. <laughs> you know, that'll send the wrong message, even if you don't know. So instead, what companies do or insiders do is they set up programs to systematically sell things over over periods of time. So in one respect, that might not be the greatest tool to use because it could be a it could be a um, a program that they're running. Uh, yeah, yeah, programmed trade. But if you do see something that's out of the ordinary, yeah, or if you're just doing your research. You know, you're looking at a at a at a company to invest in. I don't see why you wouldn't look at the insiders. 
you know, if you see all the CEOs buying and, and all the executives buying, that ought to give you a little bit more confidence that they're putting their money where their mouth is. You can tell when you look, and by the way, the place to go for this is the SEC's Edgar site. So if you just Yeah, put, you can look it up on all sorts of places too. I mean, yeah, Yahoo, Yahoo Finance, yeah, has it. Yeah, you can click on insiders and it'll tell you the recent trades. Yeah. And it is easy to see unless they just started it up when an insider is doing a program diversification. Like you'll see a, a sale every three months. Like you, you, it is clockwork. You can tell, which to your point, then it's very easy then to see if something is is different. Listen to this, a 2003 study. So this is older. And I wonder how the newer numbers look, but, but Harvard University's Leslie uh, Yang and Richard Zankhauser and Yale University's Andrew Metric found that insider purchases beat the market by 11.2% per year. Notably, by the way, insider sales were not comparably profitable. So when they sold, it wasn't necessarily profitable. That's because there's a ton of program sales. But when they bought, yeah. when insiders were buying more, that was the signal that they said to, to look for. So interesting stuff. We got links to those. Or just follow senators or, or Congress or people. just do that. Yeah. Well, by the way, link to these in our show notes at uh, stackingbenjamins.com. But I think our takeaway from that is insider trading, not illegal. And uh, make sure before you start following insiders that you actually know what's going on instead of just just uh, blindly doing following what they do. Because then you might just sue them later. And who who wants to go sue Kim Kardashian? I mean, think about all the things she's done for the world. <laughs> Isn't there already a lineup? <laughs> Hey, it's time for our TikTok Minute, the part of the show where we dive into some uh, TikTok creators' Ooh, work. TikTok. Baby. Do you know it was the number one search engine last year? TikTok. Yeah. That's why I said, did you know it oh, was? It, it was. I thought you said, do you know what is? I'm like, I think you you set that one up so that I could, like, that's my favorite trivia. So do you you're, know? You're too smart to fail. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, this, uh, this TikTok actually isn't a TikTok. A listener, Kathy sent this in and Kathy, uh, warned us. She's like, Hey, uh, this really isn't TikTok. This is major media, but sometimes they're like TikTok stars and, uh, you have to know the jargon Kathy writes. Okay. Gotta know jargon. Yes. And this is actor Dan Stevens, apparently being interviewed on uh, London television. You must have had to beat off a lot of American men to get this part. <laughs> Why does that make you giggle? Did you not have to beat them off? You had With to, a big to get the role. There was, imagine there was quite a few men up for the role as well. Is there were. Fair? There were. Um... <laughs> and compose yourself. I... <laughs> The camera people are laughing. Her co-host is laughing. <laughs> Everybody knows the terminology except her. And uh, that has nothing to do with money. That has everything to do I, with money. Know the terminology. Know, know your terminology. Know your okay. know your terminology. Got it. Absolutely. Hey, right. coming up next. Don't ask questions that you don't know the answers to. It, great. If yes. You're interviewing people. It's a synonym, by the way. Fend off. Yeah. Means the same thing. It, it, it was and and look at what just a one little different. Word does to that whole thing. Yeah. Yep. Ch yeah. Word choice is important. Completely different visual imagery. Hey, coming up next, Daniel Lamar from Cirque du Soleil uh, joins us. He is the uh, vice chairman of Cirque du Soleil. Now, was long time the CEO of the iconic company. And this company was not always doing great work. They really struggled at the beginning, but through creativity, they found their way. And if you think that creativity in your meal is like, dessert at the end. Daniel Lamar thinks differently. And so uh, he's coming up next. But first, I think, uh, Doug, you may have, uh, well, you just returned upstairs from talking to Daniel, didn't you? Just got back. Can't wait to share some things with you. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I was just upstairs giving Daniel Lamar some free consulting about how to entertain people. Among other things, I showed him how many Cheetos I can fit in my nostrils, and he shared a few pearls with me, too. I can't wait for him to tell you the story about the clown that followed him around all day. And no, he wasn't talking about Joe. You'll hear the whole thing in a minute, but apparently the clown just did silly things to lighten the mood. When something seems to be working, though, because Cirque du Soleil, which began as a troupe of 20 performers, has now put on their shows for more than 180 million people in 450 cities on every continent but Antarctica. 
what, penguins don't like to laugh? Anyway, they have half a dozen permanent shows in Las Vegas, and one is their longest running. So my question is, what year did their longest running show start? Was it 1984, 1993, or 2004? I'll be back with the answer right after I get my leotard out of the dryer. One of the toughest months, OG, to plan your money is December and January. You start getting the credit card bills and you go, oh my, what have I done? Well, if that is you and the holidays took a toll on your finances, Navy Federal Credit Union can help you take control of your finances after the holidays. You can get a low intro APR on their platinum credit card. Do balance transfers as part of your strategy to clean that up. Obviously, you need to know how to spend without the credit card and to change that behavior. But the Platinum Credit Card is their lowest rate card to create tool to pay down debt. Navy Federal also has multiple savings and investing options to help you get closer to your financial goals. But what I like best, they offer digital tools and educational resources to help guide your decisions so you can make better decisions in the future. And you know what? Have a plan for this coming December along the way. It's okay that you made mistakes. Now it's time to turn the corner and to flex that you are able to do even better. You can even buy fractional shares if you're investing, by the way, at Navy Federal. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Message and data rates may apply. Savings products insured by NCUA. Investment options are available through Navy Federal Investment Services and are not insured by NCUA. Hey there, stackers. I'm armchair acrobat and synchronized sweater, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. You know, after I inhaled that Cheeto and Daniel started laughing, I'm beginning to think I could be a clown if my brilliant rhetoric weren't so valued here on the Stacking Benjamin Show. We, too, spend up to $165 million to produce each show, so I'm needed as the moneymaker around here. So when did their longest-running show start? Though Cirque du Soleil has been around since 1984, their longest-running show, Mystere, was their first permanent show in Las Vegas. It opened up at Treasure Island in 1993, which, I regret to inform you, was 29 years ago. I'm still tight-rolling my jeans, though. That's coming back, by the way. And now, here to tell us more about that non-scary clown, it's Daniel Lamar. And coming down the stairs to the basement, it's my new friend, Daniel Lamar. Daniel, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm very excited about the relaunch of all of our shows. So that's why you're talking to a guy that is laughing right now. <laughs> and if you see the sun in my face, yes. it's because it's the new team of, of Cirque du Soleil. We're saying the sun is rising again. Boy, and what a struggle you had. COVID, uh, and you address this immediately in the book, COVID had obviously a tremendous effect on Cirque du Soleil. Uh, Tell me about the beginnings of COVID. When did you know that there was going to be probably a big problem on the horizon? I remember on March 13, which was a a Friday the 13th, which was very bad. And we just kept hearing every single hours that we had to shut down our touring shows because all the cities where we were around the world uh, were shutting down. And uh, I thought, because Las Vegas is very, very important to us, that if Las Vegas can remain open, we're good. And then on Saturday 14, (laughs) I'm at my hairdresser, And she couldn't do anything because every moment I was receiving phone calls from my people in Vegas. And then an hour later, Vegas was shut down, meaning that the company was shut down. So we went from 44 shows to zero show within 48 hours. That was a huge disaster for us. And I've read enough of your book to know that the biggest pit in your stomach was really not about the company as much as it was all of these wonderful performers that rely on the paycheck that that you're able to to deliver for them. Yeah, that was so tough because, you know, sometimes people are asking themselves, what's your purpose in life? And my purpose in life is to create jobs for artists because, you know, it's very, very tough even in today's world for an artist to have a decent life and live through his or her passion. 
And that's why I'm, uh, I'm supplying. I'm supplying about 2,000 jobs to artists. And then to have to tell them that I could not support them anymore uh, was amazingly sad for me. The decision to declare bankruptcy, I think, was probably the saddest. Can you give us any light into that about realizing that there was just no way out of it? Yeah. Within that nightmare, there was only one good news. And the good news is that the lenders were willing to support us. So we protect ourselves from from, from bankruptcies. But uh, the following day, we had the support of our lenders and a group of them took over the company and has reinvest money in our company. And uh, it says a lot about the strength of our brand because someone is willing to put $375 million to support the relaunch of Cirque while we had zero revenue. So that's why I'm saying to people, the brand is the most important asset you have. And your brand is not the theaters that you're in. Your brand is not the tables or computers you work with. Your brand specifically is creativity. And yet all the time, Daniel, you tell me that you're told consistently by people, our brand doesn't have time for creativity. And you say that that's the wrong approach. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I, I, I've certainly learned that through my, you know, 20 years at Cirque du Soleil. If there is one thing that I've learned and that I want to share with the people in our book is that there is no business without creativity. You don't have a fun personal life without creativity. And that's what I've been learning here from Guy La Liberté, our founder, from the best creators in the world, uh, you know, like Paul McCartney and James Cameron and others. And that's what has changed my life. And I hope that the book will help to change the life of few people. Well, and let's talk about your relationship with Cirque du Soleil, because it was so interesting to see how you first met Guy, who was the co-creator of Cirque du Soleil. And actually, even before I get to that, there's a lesson that you learned growing up. You grow up, you grew up poor. You said you didn't really feel poor, but you certainly were poor. Your dad had to make a big life pivot and move from really a blue collar job into the banking industry just to keep the family afloat. But at one time during that period, you went to the barbershop. And I think the barbershop story, Daniel, is one that our whole audience really needs to hear. Can you tell us what happened there? Yeah, it's so funny because we were very, very poor. So uh, my mom gave me, and I was too young to understand what I was doing, but she gave me 50 cents. And she asked me to go to the barbershop with my brother and tell the barber guy that just take away for 50 cents of my air. <laughs> like just cut the front <laughs> half or something. <laughs> so the guy was laughing and he knew exactly what my mom was doing. And he just, just sit down. We'll take care of you guys. But uh, yeah, it shows how poor we were at the time. But the generosity of that barber, that he wasn't just going to half cut you, you and your siblings, half of your hair and the generosity they had, you were able to repay to Guy. Tell me about that time, because this is really, it wasn't the first time you met him, but it was early on when you met him. Yeah, that's correct. That was in uh, 1986, and the Cirque was still struggling after uh, two years of existence. Uh, they weren't making money enough to survive. And uh, I was the, uh, the senior partner of the largest PR firm in Canada, and uh, I did a mandate for Guy, and then a few weeks later, he came back with my invoice in my office and he, he couldn't pay it. And I said to Guy, what you're trying to do is so amazing. I wish you the best of luck. And that's how our relationship started. And you ripped it up. You, you ripped it up and he then owed you no money. That's correct. And, uh, and, and it shows a lot about loyalty because move forward 13 years later, I became the head of a TV network in Canada. And uh, I called him saying, I would love to have your TV rights. And he says, oh, it's going to be very complicated because then they were very successful. They had an international company working for them. And then the following day, I received a much, the most touching note from him to his marketing vice president saying, this guy helped me out when I needed him. So he wants my TV rights. Do what you have to do. And that was so touching. Well, and this is an interesting aside because you share some statistics in the book at this point, at this juncture of the story, 
talking about people think that you're being altruistic and certainly it's fine to be altruistic and the barber's being altruistic with you. But you also talk about how givers actually receive more than takers. Talk me through those stats because I thought this is a fantastic thing I've never heard before. Yeah, no, it's uh, for me, I truly believe because sometime in the business world, you think that you have to negotiate everything and you have to be tough and you have to be a grabber and grab any piece of money that you can get. And I don't believe that. I believe that giver are the one that on the long run wins because you create great business partner that can last. You create an amazing network of people with whom you have great relationship. So for all those reasons, I always thought that being a giver, a giver will bring back to you, as my little example with Guy showed us, uh, it always comes back. I'm, I'm a true believer in that uh, philosophy. As I was reading that, I was just thinking about the number of times that I have given to somebody purely because they've given to me before. It's just a powerful reminder of how important these relationships were. And clearly your relationship with Guy ended up helping both of you. I believe, well, and, and based on everything in the book, you were able to help him grow well beyond what they had imagined possible. And he gave you this whole new creative outlook, which I thought was also incredibly refreshing. I want to ask you some questions though about negotiation here in a second. But before we get to that, I want to ask about how you negotiate because Bob Iger, who has a nice blurb at the beginning of your book, along with James Cameron and a few other people, Bob Iger, of course, the recently uh, retired gentleman at the top of Disney, Bob in his master class talks about his negotiation technique. And he's had some obviously big negotiations with Marvel and with James Cameron, with George Lucas You've had some amazing negotiations that I want to get into in a second, but he said his negotiation technique, Daniel, is to just lay his cards all out on the table. He just lays them all out. Is that your negotiation technique or tell me about what, how you go into some of these negotiations that I'm about to ask you about with MGM and the, the damn Beatles. You had negotiated with the Beatles. Yeah, I truly believe that if you understand what is the motivation of the other party to do a deal, that's where you will be able to lay the ground for a win-win uh, negotiation. And that's why at the early days of a business discussion, I spent a lot of time listening, trying to understand what are the things that the people on the other side of the table wants to get from us. And that, when you have that clearly, it's much easier than to come to the table with an offer that will suit their needs and your needs. You have the amazing Beatles love show. You're negotiating with the Beatles. I want to know, first of all, how that started. Did you, did the creative team have this idea? We want to do the Beatles and then you reached out to them or did they reach out to you? And then what, what did the Beatles really want from this? What was in it for the Beatles? Yeah, uh, it started, uh, there was a friendship already established between George Harrison and our founder, Guy La Liberté. And uh, at one point they want, they said, that will be great if we can do something together. And uh, the real uh, challenge for us was to come with a creative idea that will be at the level of their music. And that was a challenge for us to illustrate to them how we can pay tribute to their music and bring that to the level of their brand. And all the conversation was about that, to show them that we will be respectful of their brand. And while we understood that they didn't want anybody else to pussyfoot around with their uh, legacy music, uh, I, I think the clincher is in the negotiation was when we proposed to have George Martin who has been producing his music, their music, to come to the table and be part of the creative team. That was really why we have been able to have the deal that we have today. You were able to bridge the gap through that one person. That's exactly right. And then they felt comfortable because they said, you know, our music legacy is protected by George Martin. And then Cirque du Soleil are the best live show creator in the world. Therefore, we have a great deal of confidence. But the one thing when you approach something like that, 
you have to agree to yourself that the main public to reach out first were the Beatles itself. That was very, very important for us that Paul, Ringo, Olivia Harrison, and Yoko Ono uh, felt very good about the content of the show. So we spent a fair amount of time, even if we were not obligated by contract, we spent a ton of meetings with them to illustrate to them what the content of the show was going to be to make sure that we will please them. And our reasoning there was if we please the Beatles, then our chances increases by a mile to really please their fans. I thought of so many analogies in my own life when you told that story in the book about how spending that extra time and talking about how we're going to be respectful and this will be more of a long-term loving relationship where we're building the legacies really of everybody. I think that extra care is so important. And obviously that's why it's lasted so long, I'm sure. Yeah, totally. And also in, in the creative process, I always thought that being respectful to the other members of your creative team is very, very important. And then again, that's why when you nurture creativity, what does it mean? It also means that you're nurturing relationship with your colleagues. You're nurturing relationship in your personal life with, you know, your love, with your family. And, and that's something that creativity brings. It enriches your personal and your professional life. You had a completely different negotiation with the owner of the Mirage MGM. They have a $30 million budget. You explained to us that $30 million is sounds like a lot of money, but that ain't going to do it. <laughs> Tell me about that, that, creating that win. Boy, you had to go that, not even the extra mile, probably the extra thousand miles on a jet plane, Daniel, to get this thing done. <laughs> yeah, that was a very interesting story because we had a good relationship with MGM and we had already, uh, you know, very successful shows on the Strip. So one of our creative guy came to me and showed me the amazing design of the actual theater of the Beatles show. So we flew to Las Vegas. We knew that the CEO of MGM was having his table at the same restaurant all the time. We just show up at his, at his table and he look at us and says, guy, what are you doing here? We said, we have something to show you. Just give us five minutes. He sounded like he was so annoyed. He was so annoyed you were there. <laughs> Right. Totally. And then he says, you know, how much does this theater cost? And I said, I have no idea. I'm not the construction guy. Your people knows about construction. And therefore, he calls me two or three weeks later. And he says, Daniel, I want to have a meeting, you know, a video conference with you and all your creative team. And I gather everybody in the, in the room. And then he says, Daniel, you know, I want to talk to you and your team. And I said, go ahead. We're here. He said, I just have one thing to tell you guys. First, the theater is costing $90 million. The show is better to be good. <laughs> <laughs> I read that first statement when he said 90 million, and I can imagine the pit in your stomach. Like, oh, this is going south right now. <laughs> yeah, but uh, again, it says a lot about the importance of pushing the boundaries of your creativity all the time. And that's what, that's what we did here, because we thought from the get-go that if we have a theater that is a statement in itself, people will realize that we are treating the Beatles brand and the Cirque du Soleil brand at the level that it should be. And it's working. Let's talk about the Cirque du Soleil brand. You walk in to the get ready for the first press conference where they're announcing your appointment. You are in a suit and tie. And luckily, Guy wasn't there because you say that Guy would have cut your tie immediately. <laughs> but there was someone else there and she was taking care of you, making sure that you got rid of the tie, uh, uh, change it up. Tell me, tell me about not a culture transforming, but your transformation from some companies that may have been somewhat creative to an amazingly creative organization like Cirque du Soleil. Yeah, that was kind of a, a shock for me because you can imagine, you know, the CEO of a TV network showing up here with his, you know, jacket and tie and traditionally dressed and the marketing person from Cirque telling me, you cannot show up. 
in a press conference of Cirque du Soleil wearing a tie. And I said, you're serious? She says, yeah. And she didn't let me talk. She just took it away from me. <laughs> and she said, oh, no, your jacket doesn't work. And I said, what do we do? And then she took kind of a leather jacket of Cirque du Soleil and put it on. And even me showing up that way at the press conference, the media that knew me were very surprised. I said, oh, my God, that's <laughs> quite a change. <laughs> I, I, I want to, yeah, you got letters. I, I remember people going, we thought you were crazy ahead of time, Daniel, but, but now we know you're crazy. We know. And you actually talk about several changes like that, that you made where you had to think about things much more creatively, but I want to ask you this, which is much more about the internal operation of Cirque du Soleil. You were followed around by a clown, literally <laughs> followed around by a clown who would interrupt serious meetings who would make light of situations and everybody would leave laughing and it would sometimes disarm some, some, what sounded like maybe heated conversations or, or creative differences. You say that the average organization obviously doesn't need to put a clown on the payroll, but you have a point about the clown. What's the point? Yeah. You know, when Guy offered me that gift <laughs> to have my personal clown, uh, I burst laughing as you can imagine, but then I understood that it became, and it's still, by the way, she's still here, Madame Zazu, we called her. She has become a symbol, reminding me and all the employees of Cirque, that's what we're doing. We're doing entertainment. So that's why I'm saying to any, any organization, doesn't matter what you do, you must have a symbol that illustrates what you do. If you're a toy company, I think, you know, you should have kids, uh, you know, in the building playing with your uh, with your toys, or you should be playing with your own toys. And if you have car, people should be entitled to try those cars. You have to define what is the symbol that will remain your people daily. That's what you stand for. That's the nature and that's the purpose of what you do. We were having this discussion at my house. My my spouse, Cheryl, had some uh, knee surgery and we were going through the healthcare process and I wanted to hand them all your book and talk about going through, going through because people going through this process, I think a lot of the doctors, nurses, seeing things from the patient side and to your point, seeing things from the customer side is so important. The people that come to see your show and seeing the spectacle that they see from their, from their vantage point, creativity is not just important. It seems like it has to be the lifeblood. No, you're right. It's a state of mind. And when I walk in a theater of Cirque du Soleil, the only thing I'm looking at is the public reaction, because that's what is important to us. And because I'm there to entertain them. And if they're not entertained enough, then I might have an issue. So to go back to your health, uh, you know, uh, healthcare situation, uh, I think it's very important that the people that are working there remind themselves what is their purpose in life. And their purpose in life is to take care of people. And, and, and sometimes they're too, you know, related to their own scientific and or, uh, you know, uh, hospitality, uh, hospitality uh, situation that they forget why they are there. And they're there to take care of people. And I bet you that they don't even use those words, taking care of people. And I think that's a great place to leave this. The book is called Balancing Acts, Unleashing the Power of Creativity in Your Work and Life. And I'm assuming, Daniel, it is available everywhere. Yeah, it will be starting in January. And uh, I'm really looking forward to sh not only share the book, but for me, it's a springboard for exchanging with our people, talking with people, communicating with people. So that's why you're talking right now to someone that is so excited because it's a new experience for me. Well, it's, it's new for us too. And I have to tell you, speaking of taking care of people, your organization is taking care of my family and friends many times. We've loved the shows. Thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, this is Lou Mangello from WDW Radio, and when I'm not at Walt Disney World or sharing my passion for Disney World or eating, I am stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Daniel. Lighten the mood, people. Lighten the mood. I think there's a big lesson there. 
I think you can dive into some of these really heady topics, OG, to, to tie a financial bow on what Daniel was talking about. You can dive into these heady topics that a lot of money nerds know we need to talk about. If you just lighten up the conversation a little, if you have a little creativity, make it a little fun so that the other people want to be there and, uh, and look at what happens. So basically like what we've been trying to do for the last 10 years. That crazy talk. No, no. Why would we do that? Absolutely. I mean, and you think about in, in your role, uh, your daytime role as a financial planner, like how you approach these conversations, I think is as important as having them. Because if you approach a conversation with a client in the wrong way, that's a non-starter. That's right. You've got to be cognizant of how you're going to put it all together and kind of tell the story. You know, if you just kind of lead with, hey, great news, you're never going to retire because you're saved like an idiot. So good luck. Like that doesn't really do anything for anybody. So, this know? is the tie in with, uh, with, uh, Dan Stevens, like know the right terminology. That's right. Know the room. Hey, let's start with Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first, OG. Uh, more coffee. Oh yeah. I'm feeling like I need a little bit more coffee. Well, what most people value is their loved ones, their time, and a lot of us coffee. It's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackingbenjamins.com slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. I love it when people do this because you get it taken care of. It's done. You know, if you're out there and you need life insurance, let's get this done now. Hit the pause button. Their application is simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision affordable prices and all policies issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, which is a more than 160 year old insurer. And today we're going to throw out the lifeline to Micah. Say hi, Micah. All right, guys, real quick question. Other than this uh, podcast, which is great, are there any other ways and or books that you recommend to enhance my financial literacy? Thank you. Oh, Micah, uh, if only there were a new book that just came out. <laughs> Here it comes. If only, Here it comes. If only. Oh boy. Is this a plant? I know, What's funny right? Is that I didn't even think of that. <laughs> you didn't even comes the plug. <laughs> that wasn't on my list of books to get. I was like <laughs> no, looking at my shelf and I was like, well, there's all these really good books. Here. If only there were a book that that took you through all the steps from the from the bottom to the top. There's a book called Stack, Micah, and you can come uh, hang out with us on tour. We're going to 40 cities starting on March 1st. OG will be at some of those cities. Doug's going to be in some of those cities. Doc G will be in some. I know that uh, Emily Guy Birkin, my co-author, is going to be in some, but it's called Stacked, your super serious guide to modern money management. But let's take that one off the table, OG. I'll tell you a book that inspired me for a long period of time. Uh, Rick Edelman's The Truth About Money, I thought was really good. I also like uh, Bola Sukumbi has a great book called Clever Girl Finance, which is also a fantastic place to begin. I'm going to go with one of my my favorite money books right now, uh, Matt Hall's book. Oh, that is a good book. Okay, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to go with that one. Yeah, those are some some good stuff. You know, we like and and this uh, organization, this nonprofit, is sponsoring me going around the country a million stories. And if you go dive into the million stories videos, people like Richard Sherman, uh, the football player, has a great series called Adulting. These are maybe five to eight minute video series. Uh, so it's like a Netflix, but it's all about different money topics. There's one called Face Palm, which is uh, really smart people talking about how they messed up their money. That's a great series. I like uh, George Goes Everywhere. We had George Igo on the show. George takes $100 and goes to big cities around the US and sees how all the cool stuff he can do in a city. So check out a uh, million stories. And I know, yeah, you know that- how, Joe, you know how people oftentimes like to look for the movie instead of the, because the books, the reading books are hard, right? It's a lot of time and there's all the words and the, so, you know, one of my favorites, and I can't believe you guys didn't recommend this, Brewster's Millions <laughs> yes. with Richard Pryor. That's right. It's I mean, a great that's, movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, you just get all of the, like the quick bullet points of how to manage your money and you know, you're done in like an hour and 45 minutes. Well, and it is strange when you say that, you know, what inspired me initially to even consider being a financial planner was Wall Street, where the lesson is you insider trade and go to jail, right? Oh, I get three square meals. That's fantastic. It's just, it's a heartwarming yarn. (laughs) So good. Thanks for, thanks for that call, Micah. If you've got a question, for us and the Haven Lifeline, stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail gets you there. And uh, Micah is getting a Stacky Benjamins circus tea, which that's the mug I'm drinking out of today. Greatest money show on earth. 
How in the world are you not giving out books, Joe? What do you mean? To the people who call. Well, I think I should. I think I should be giving one to Micah, shouldn't I? Do you think? <laughs> let's let's consider let's consider that. Sorry to be Captain Obvious, but you can see you can see how great we are at selling this book, everybody. Oh, gee, didn't even think about it. I can't figure out why we've only sold seven of them. <laughs> Did even enter his radar. <laughs> yes. Now, but you started something, Doug. Now everybody's going to call in and go, "Hey, what's another way for me to get financial literacy?" Yeah. Like that's going to happen <laughs> over and over and over. Welcome. Is there a thing with words on paper <laughs> that I could get? If only. And, and I really like the color yellow for my, <laughs> all right, that's going to do it for today. We've got a lot of people to thank and Doug, you're going to handle that in a second, but a big thanks to you. If you're hanging out with us, spending time, we appreciate your time and uh, a lot of, a lot of great takeaways from today's show. Oh, gee. I mean, lots of great discussion on insider trading and, and uh, the fact that you actually can follow insiders if you're into that and it's not necessarily illegal. It might have been, I don't know if it's illegal or not what Kim Kardashian did, but if you're playing in the wild west, guess what? You're going to get the wild west. Sounds illegal. Yes. And then creativity in your job, creativity in your job, probably, probably something there. But if you need to think bigger, make better decisions this year, next year and beyond, OG and his team are taking clients. So head to stackingbenjamins.com slash OG. That's the link to his team's calendar, and uh, they will get you set up to talk about how they can help you think bigger. All right, that's going to do it for today. Doug, what should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first, it's important to understand the delicate differences in language among countries. Nothing beats some firsthand experience. Second, take some advice from Daniel Lamar. It's time to lighten up. Your silliness may just lead to your success. But the big lesson... <laughs> A show that costs $165 million better have some fireworks. So, Steve, let's do this. There. Now it feels like a high-quality show, right? Thanks to Daniel Lamar. You can find his book, Balancing Act, wherever you pick up your red noses and rainbow-colored curly wigs. Our show is written in part by Paulette Perhatch, who helps writers power their words, their work, and their earning potential with her Powerhouse Writers Coaching Program, which starts this week on January 19th. Find out more at powerhousewriters.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Rapine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch with help from Joe and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor.
So while he's gone, I, well, uh, I thought it'd be a fantastic idea to get bourbon barrel uh, roasted coffee. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. I saw it at Costco yesterday. And? It is f***ing awful. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, nothing I want to wake up to in the morning than the smell of the worst part of alcohol. Yeah, right. Like, seriously. Right. It is coffee, and it smells like alcohol. And I'm like, why do I want that? But I'm such a miser with my money that I, you know, I'm going to drink gonna it. You're going to power through it. <laughs> I am. But I immediately bought some Dunkin' Donuts coffee <laughs> to, to do, like, right after this. Because I always get excited about Dunkin' Donuts. You're going to chase it with Dunkin' Donuts? Yes. Like bourbon coffee with a Dunkin' Chaser? (laughs) (laughs) So I just want to warn everybody, short after show today, Doug, don't buy buy the bourbon barrel coffee. Did you get all 10 pounds of it at Costco? I did did not. Yeah, I got my palate. I got my palate of coffee. (laughs) It is alluring. I just walked by it yesterday and I thought, oh, so appreciate the heads up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, One star. (laughs) One star. Unsubscribe.